I am so engaged with this is I still believe that what adults do is adults' business, but leave the children alone. And when they started going after the children and trying to push this gender ideology and this queer theory on children, transing children, indoctrinating children, I believe this is why when you look at these polls, you see the support for LGBTQ rights declining. <laughs>
I will accept you and I will affirm you. We both know a lady named uh, Aaron Lee, um, and she sat in the same chair and told the story of the indoctrination of her daughter, where she went, the daughter was invited to uh, art club after school, which there was no art involved, but there was somebody there to teach her about trans and to convince her that she's trans and to give her little rewards uh, and to also say, as every parent fears, don't tell your parents about this. I told my kids, if anybody ever says, don't tell your parents, the first thing you do is tell your parents. Yes. It, 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 is, um, it is a grooming behavior. It is predatory and it is ugly. And I'm not talking about adults. I'm talking about what's going on with kids. If somebody, um, and I've been to drag shows, I think they're a kick. Uh, but uh, when you say they're kids in drag shows, give me, give me an example. Absolutely, I'll give you several examples. There is uh, a drag performer who is 15 years old. This last weekend, we have on our social media channel, our Twitter, now called X, and our Instagram. And what's the handle on that? At GAG underscore Colorado. GAG underscore Colorado. And we've gone undercover and exposed this 15-year-old boy performing provocatively for adults. These adults are, what I see it as, they're training these children and they're commodifying these children basically as sex objects. Sexual objects to be commodified and appreciated by the adults. The adults are throwing their money at this. In one clip that we have on there, there's even an adult reaching out and grabbing the butt of this child, this 15-year-old boy. And I, that is extremely inappropriate in my opinion. And I don't see how any adult can say that is acceptable. Are you just a prudish gay man? Is that, is that the oh, problem I am here? not a prude, I promise you that. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, I think that sexuality is something that belongs in the adult world. And at that age, when a child is still, the, the prefrontal cortex that's responsible for logic and reasoning and your self-identity is still developing. And so to be planting these seeds um, of confusion about what your gender is and to be teaching them to perform like that for adults is damaging to that child. It destroys their innocence. It destroys their sense of self-worth. And that ultimately leads later on down the road. And there's tons of research that you can find on our website, radar at gaysagainstgroomers.com. You can find, and it's research, legitimate peer-reviewed research. So... That shows go, go, going back to this 15 year old, what if he wants to do it? What if his parents are okay do him doing it? And uh, obviously the schools are very supportive these days and this is just who he is. Why is that a problem? Well, how did, like I just said, that prefrontal cortex that's responsible for logic, decision making and your self identity has not developed yet. And even if it is the parents are supportive of it, what parent exposes their child to this type of sexualization? What is the purpose of Gays Against Groomers? Gays? You know, because you are gay, you have a different credibility about this. That's why even the name sticks out and go, what, what, what? What is, what is your end goal? Gays Against Groomers exists, there's three things that we really focus on and it's all related to children. So. We're, I have no problem, we're not anti-trans. If you're an adult and you wanna do that to yourself, go for it. You're an adult, you can give consent. We also don't have any problem with adult drag shows. Where we have a problem is with the indoctrination, the sexualization, and the medicalization of children under the guise of LGBT IQA plus inclusion. I know what you're talking about. I'm just trying to make sure I get the right words for this. We see it all the time. We get calls on it all the time, particularly in schools. All right, the drag show, all right, that might be extreme, but in the classroom, what is not extreme is the get up and give your preferred pronoun. Um, and a seems to be a predatory group of people who want to find a kid who's going through a tough time. They go, you know why you feel out of sorts? You feel out of sorts because you know you're. 
Well, they're targeting, you're, not, you're, not, you're not a boy, really. They're targeting children at one of their most vulnerable stages of life when they're going through adolescence and puberty. And there's a lot of questions surrounding who you are and changes that are happening, happening to the body and to the brain at this time. And so they're targeting that child at its most vulnerable stage. And what they're trying to do in our schools, and even at the state legislature, the state legislature right now has several bills that are passing through the, the, the House and the Senate that aim to keep what these schools are doing a secret and not inform the parents. So your child can go to school and tell the, the school that, hey, I identify as a they, them, or a z, zam, or I identify as a cat or a dog or an elephant and my name is something different, and the school would be required to affirm that child's identity and name. So this is about compelling the speech of others. That has always been my bugaboo with this. I don't care what people think, I don't care how you identify, um, but to, to force speech upon me is against every American tradition, it's against our civil liberties. You wanna consider yourself a he, uh, but you're gonna force me to say a he to someone who's obviously a she? No, what you're doing is infringing on my rights. You have the right to identify any way you like. I have the right to identify you any way I like. That's called free speech. And there was a time when the left was the predominant protector of free speech. That is no longer the case in America. So oddly, it's the right that is now the protector of free speech. And who thought that would be the case? But it's, it's, it's this, idea that you have to speak something that you believe is untrue in order to keep your job, in order to stay in school, in order to pass a class. If you're at the workplace, you're going to go to, to HR in an instant and you could lose your job if you don't say something you believe to be yeah. wholly untrue. You and can... by the way, it is scientifically untrue. Uh, you know, this, is, this is what gets me, you know, follow the science. Well, we have XY chromosomes and XX chromosomes. Exactly. You know, yeah. and, and this is somebody who is a man who identifies as a woman. Great. That's a title. But I am not going to call that person she when she is a he. And you can't make me. But I'm old and cranky. You can make young people do it. And you can make bureaucrats do it. And you can make big corporations do it because uh, they've got things to lose. Well, and that's where it all goes back to in the schools is the indoctrination of children. And if you can get those children on board with this and you can convince the children that there are multiple pronouns that they can use, that you can change your name. And here's what's the, the really scary thing about all of this. This legislation that's in, in, the, in right now being debated came out of an ad hoc youth advisory committee. So that was created when the legislative session was not happening. It was a small group of legislators who got together with a group of children who put this proposal together for several bills, advance it out of this ad hoc committee, again, a committee that wasn't meeting during the regular legislative session and introduced it right away into the legislative session and not a single parent was involved in this. That's amazing. You know, I remember the story from Erin Lee when her daughter was told by the expert they brought in to, to art club which wasn't an art club, it was an indoctrination. And she told this poor girl, you know, if you're not 100% comfortable in your own body, that means you're trans. And I don't know any 12 year old girl who's comfortable in her body. I don't know any human who's comfortable in their body, except um, obviously you. But, you know, it, 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 is, it is crazy. So you're trying to stop these laws what is the education you're trying to tell people? Because I think you've got a different platform. Were you involved in any of the gay rights movement back when it was front page news? Oh, absolutely. I was one of those gays that was right down here on the state capitol wanting same-sex marriage, advocating for same-sex marriage, and educating people about why this is important to two people who love each other for the legal protections. Love is love. We deserve the same respect. What two consenting adults do is... None of your business. None of your business. And I think there was a lot of support for that. And I think where one of the reasons I'm so, I am so engaged with this is I still believe that what adults do is adults' business. But leave the children alone. 
And when they started going after the children and trying to push this gender ideology and this queer theory on children, transing children, indoctrinating children, and when we get into this, we can talk about the drugs that they're using on children, Lupron, the side effects of Lupron, which, by the way, is an off-label use as a puberty blocker. When we talk about cross-hormone therapy and the damage that that does to the body, the surgeries that leave your body permanently mutilated, the emotional trauma, and they want to say, oh, we got to do this because it reduces suicidal ideology among children. The research shows that after transitioning, suicidal ideology increases. I want you to repeat that because I know people, people I love have kids who are going through this. And the poor adults, the poor parents will do anything to stop the suffering, will do anything to make sure the kid does not commit suicide or self-harm. If they're cutting themselves, if they're doing drugs, and the therapists come up and say, well, address this person as the different gender. That helps. And then later on, it's, well, you know, having some of these uh, hormone blockers or perhaps even surgery. And, you know, my mind thinks I would never allow that to my kid. Never, yeah. never, never. But then again, you've got a kid who's about ready to commit suicide. The bigger thing that parents have is keep your kids safe. So in that, that dichotomy of let the child uh, permanently scar, mess up, mutilate uh, her body, uh, maybe taking away the possibility of her having children later, changing her voice, so and that can't, might not change back either, but it keeps her alive. Well, that's a simple answer for, for any parent. For Let's many keep people her alive. it would be, right? I, you, if you love your child, you want to do anything to protect them and keep them alive. But you have to ask yourself several things. And like I just said, the suicidal ideology increases after transitioning. That's what people don't get. That's what they're not being told. Also, we don't have that much experience with it because this, this craziness hasn't been around all that long. No, it hasn't. And so there hasn't really been a whole lot of research that has evaluated the long-term impacts of gender-affirming care on minors. And we're just now starting to understand the chemical complications that are coming out from things like Lupron. The the fact that it leaves these people permanently sterile, prone to brittle bones, cancer, heart disease, shortened life expectancy. And then, you know, if you, com you combine all of that, it's painful, it hurts. And I, I really believe that's why these detrans people, these people who have detransitioned, their voices are critical. And the people who are transgender that have gone through this, who are members of our organization, have firsthand experience of going through that. I can't, as a gay man who identifies as a gay, man. a gay man, I was born a man, I cannot speak to their experiences, but they can. And I think that's why it's so important that we listen to their what stories. Do, what do you hear from people who have D-trans, which is a term I'm unfamiliar with, but I know what you're talking about. People who are older and go, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. And now I want to go back to what my chromosomes say I am. And there is no going back. Why is there no going back? Puberty, you just, when you, you block, just, you just it, it's, a, it's a blocker, and then you just unblock it, and everything's fine. It doesn't go back. It doesn't happen again. When you go through puberty at that age and you block it from happening, if you decide that you're gonna block puberty at 14, 15, or 16 years of age, and then just all of a sudden decide at 19 or 20 or 21 that you're not gonna stay on these hormone therapies, these, the, the Lupron, the, you don't undo what your body was supposed to have done 10 years before that. Talk to me a little bit. Well, first of all, uh, I'm assuming this is a paying gig for you. This is your full-time job. <laughs> Not a penny. You haven't made a penny I off of it. I haven't made a penny off of it. Why do you feel so impassioned to do this? You got nothing better to do with your life? <laughs> you have... got nothing better to do? I no, could do what, a lot what? of things better with my life, right? But, but well, here's yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. You don't get paid. I don't get paid. You feel passionate about it. I, I want to know what, what the passion is that you feel so strongly that this is a call. I, I think children are something that are worth protecting. And I think that the truth has to come out. And as someone who grew up in an era where we didn't have the opportunity to come out and tell the world that, hey, I'm gay, accept me for who I am, there was 
my personal experience is I went through conversion therapy, a different form of it. So I understand the pains of that. I understand what it's like to You say you went through conversion therapy? I did. To, 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 to not to, be gay. To get the gay out of you. Yes. We're going to Jesus the gay out of you. Basically. All right. And they didn't Jesus the gay out nope. of you. Nope. All right. It didn't work. Um, we have come a long way in that regard. In fact, back in the 1940s and the 50s, there was frontal lobotomies for people who were homosexuals. And then we went through the electroshock therapy. We had the faith-based organizations. And now I see this gender-affirming care as much the same thing. Your child isn't gay. Your child isn't lesbian. We'll just trans away the gay. And it's more wow. socially acceptable to have a trans child than it is a gay or lesbian child. You think so? I believe so. So let me see if I'm hearing you correctly. You believe that what bottomization, drug therapy, um, uh, hormone therapy, the electroshock, the, uh, the, the stigma of being gay, what the trans community is doing to young kids is equivalent to what society was doing to gay men and women I do. back when it was criminalized. I do. And I don't want to, I'm not going to say that this is the trans community that's doing this. I know a lot of transgender individuals who are not on board with this. What I think is happening is you have governments that are behind this that are funding it. You have big pharma that's behind it. You have the medical industry who's behind this. Because if you can get a person at the age of 10 reliant on pharmaceutical industry to be on these chemicals for the rest of their life, that is a guaranteed revenue stream that they can't stop. Who funds the activists on the other side? That is a great question. Um, it's a very powerful thing. If you look at the whole transgender movement and the ideology going all the way up to WHO, the World Health Organization, and here's the thing that I'm going to say. People want to come at me and say, "How are you, who are you to speak on behalf of this? Are you a biologist? Well, no, I am a molecular biologist, by the way. So <laughs> or a biologist. I, I understand biology <laughs> at a genetic level. That is my PhD. So in other words, if you were a Supreme Court nominee and someone asked, can you give me the definition of, of female, you would be able to say, because I'm a biologist, <laughs> like your last guest. I can guest, explain it at a genetic level. It. Right. And here's the thing. They are so heavily funded, and it goes all the way from who to you look at the United States federal government and people we have in key cabinet positions at the U.S. government. You look at people who are in the state level right now and some of the, the people that are advancing these bills and sponsors of these bills at the state legislative level. You look at organizations. It's powerful media organizations. Name them. Uh, ad, the Advocate, Out Front Media, right here in Colorado, One Colorado, you have the schools, you have organizations like Northern Colorado Safe Space, the Center on Colfax, the United Church of Christ is getting, and we have churches. You said, you said um, NOCO. Northern Colorado Safe Space. All right, help me, what is that? There, just, and this is just one. one example. They're all over the state of Colorado. They're all over the country. These are organizations that exist specifically for affirming queer youth. Not queer adults. Some of them have, the Center on Colfax, I will say, they do have adult programs, but they have youth-specific programs like Rainbow Alley that target youth. And Rainbow only Alley, youth. help me out. This, these are youth programs for queer identifying youth, LGBTQ youth, and they have these places where they can go and they can get counseling and therapy and not even have, the parents don't even know sometimes that this is happening. These are also programs that are being sponsored in schools. These organizations are well-funded, like GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network, national organization. They go into schools with PFLAG, the Parents of Friends of Lesbians and Gays, and they go educate these school administrators and these school boards and these teachers about how to create safe spaces for LGBTQ identifying children. They set up counseling referral. They set up referrals for if a child says that they want to start going through social transitioning and, eat, and the list goes on. And this is happening right here in Colorado. I got somebody reached out to me the other day in Southwest Colorado a couple months ago. Someone said, hey, this is happening in Grand Junction. It's north, all over. So that's so, what they're doing. These organizations. Let me, let me throw this you. one at you. 
Um, I'm pushing 60 years old. I've got a cousin who's a gay man and we were having a beer and he's like talking about all the, the, the gay and lesbian support groups in, in school and high school. And he was like, where the hell was that when I was trying to come out? Where are the, you know, these kids, basically it's like, we went through some tough times and having to come out back then was awful and coming out to, and these kids have no idea how easy they have it. So let me throw it back at you. Are you just trying to be hard on, on trans kids? Because, you know, it would have been great if there was a way for uh, people my age when they wanted to come out to come out when they were younger and, and not, be, not be isolated. It's, isn't it just the same thing? No, it's not. Because there, here's the difference. There's a difference between providing those resources and that therapy to help you because, you know, there's a lot of trauma that's associated with it. And I think that there is a fine line that we can walk with helping a child. Here's the thing. If your child comes to you and says, I think I'm trans and they don't have the ability to understand what that means and they don't understand the biology of sex yet, then the reality is, are you going to affirm that? Or are you going to say, you know what? We can work through this. You are how you were created to be. You are who you were born as. And affirming and if a you child's born... reality, I believe, is more important than saying, okay, well, we'll go ahead and accept the fact that you, and you can't do that to a child and you can't start them down this process of irreversible harm and irreversible damage because later on down the road, what if they do realize that I made a mistake? And I think that's the difference. Beyond my frustration with um, the First Amendment issues, the forced speech issues of it all, um, the difference of being gay, coming out as a gay man in high school, or in junior high, whatever years back, you're a gay man. It doesn't mean we want to treat you with chemicals. It doesn't mean we want to uh, chop off body parts. We want to mutilate you. We want, you know, all right. you, you want to wear a dress, wear a dress. Uh, but you're not, you're not being subjected to the harm of bodily injury. Exactly. And I think that's where, when you start looking at it also, you know, I was probably a very different child growing up. I was the child that liked to sew, liked to cook, and I didn't really play with Barbie dolls. I was also that child that would cut the hair off my sister's Barbie dolls and pop their head off. <laughs> That's just being a brother. That there were three boys and one girl in my family, so yeah. <laughs> you know my sister survived somehow. Um, but it was I was also the person I loved to be outside. I loved to work on old cars. I. I was the rough and tumble of my family also. So I think, you know, we look at these things nowadays and we say, oh, this child likes to play with dolls. Maybe they're trans or this, this girl likes to play with boy right. things and play and that's sports. Fine. And so that doesn't mean that that, per that child is transgender or non-conforming. That just means that they like to play with balls and throw a tennis ball around or play play football as a girl or volleyball as a girl. And there's nothing wrong with that. Or that boy wants to learn how to sew or cook. There's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't mean that they are trans. And you affirm the child for who they are biologically. And you help them navigate this difficult time in life where their prefrontal cortex and their self-identity and their logic and their reasoning are developing. And you say, hey, we're here to support you as a parent and we love you, but you come talk to us and we're gonna support you. But you have these figures in places that are supposed to be safe, right? You have teachers, you have school administrators, you have these drag queens and these people coming to these children and saying, well, if your parent doesn't accept you, come talk to me and I will accept you. And don't tell your parents. Don't tell your parents. The, the tagline of every pedophile, don't tell your parents. Yep. So no wonder people, get, parents get crazed when they hear that. And this is what's, I, th I believe this is why when you look at these polls, you see the support for LGBTQ rights declining. Yeah, let me ask you about that. You know, and I understand in order to get where we've gotten on the acceptance of the gay lifestyle, uh, gay marriage, 
of marriage equality, that it takes a coalition. It takes a huge coalition of, 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 of people. And so bringing in the LGB, that makes sense. Well, T, yeah, come on in, be part of the party because you'll help us get us over the finish line. And now is there this sense of, well, now that we got us over the finish line and the gay lifestyle is not just accepted, but I would say celebrated. You know, Pride Week and is, you know, every restaurant has rainbows at it, on it to the point where I think the gay community is being exploited, but that's a topic for another time. Do you feel like, wait a second, you know, we wanted gay equality, and now is there a guilt factor that many gay, lesbian, bisexual people feel like, well, now it's T's turn, and so we better help T, even though we think T is just crazy? I, you know, I can't speak for the whole community, but as an organization, I think where we see it is this whole ideology of transing children has been harmful to our cause as we fight for equality. And a lot of people will say, we were fine when you guys wanted to marry another person of the same sex. We were fine when you said that the two of you wanted to go and own property together. We were fine when the two of you said that you wanted to make end of life decisions. That was your choice. But when you started coming after our children, that's when you crossed the line. And they drew a hard line in the sand. And I think that is where we're seeing that pushback and the erosion of support for LGBTQ equality. Do you think it could negatively impact gay and lesbian rights? I think it is already. And it's interesting because I will hear people make these comments about, well, I don't understand how you could align yourself with that organization or that organization or that political ideology they're gonna come for you next. And they'll make that comment. It's like, no, what we're really actually trying to do is we're trying to build a wall between what's happening already in the erosion because we're going after children and stop that from expanding any further into our rights as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender adults. Because if you keep going after children, they will eventually come after us. And so if we work with these groups to say, you have to stop what you're doing to the children, but they don't, the other, the problem is though, you have these organizations in the LGBTQ community who for far too long have thought that they were the voice of the community and they spoke for us. And it takes people like me within the community to say, you don't speak for all of us. And you need to sit down and you need to be quiet and you need to let us speak for ourselves. That's incredible. Let me, let me change this a little bit. The money behind it, the machinery behind it, during the fight for gay rights, there was not the same machinery. There was not school districts. There was not pharma. There, there wasn't all these organizations that came out. There were brave individuals who, you know, starting from Stonewall on, you could see what they were doing. I remember uh, the fights over whether or not to out people. And this was a big step and inside the gay community was like, we have to out them so people know that, yeah, your, your cousin, he's gay too. Rock Hudson's gay? Oh my God, how could Rock be gay? Um, you know, and so I remember all these, all these steps and it seems as though you crossed a finish line you cross the finish line of social acceptance that I never thought would happen uh, so quickly in my lifetime, that you'd have not just uh, civil unions, but marriage equality, that uh, you've got a Supreme Court decision that says, no, men and women can get married. You know, th these, are, these are hardcore policy victories, and there is a goalpost, and you went past that goalpost. And it seems to me that all this machinery that was built for that, it's like, well, now what do we do? Do we go back to our lives? Do we celebrate it? But it seems as though there's this hunger of, well, we gotta, we gotta stand up to oppression somewhere. We're gonna find the oppression as if there was a profit motive to keep it. It reminds me after um, prohibition ended, it was the same guys who put in the prohibition laws and enforced them that became the, the war on drugs guys. That, that started the war on, on heroin and, and targeting black people like Billie Holiday and said, because they didn't want to give up their jobs. 
but you cross the goal line. And that's exactly what happened. I, I personally feel that once we re, we achieved equality, I, I remember where I was at when the newspaper article front page was that the Supreme Court had ruled in favor of same-sex marriage. I was in Durango, I was at the Strader Hotel, and I picked up the Durango Herald. And that was a momentous occasion for us as lesbian gay people, as heteros, as homosexual people, that was momentous for us. That was a watershed moment. And there was a lot of happy people because I, I know people who had been together for decades, gay couples, lesbian couples, and they, they would have what we called commitment ceremonies. Yep, I remember them well. Because they couldn't legally get married. And they would go through this whole process of power of attorney to be able to say, hey, if something happens to me, you, you get the house, you get the life insurance policy. If, I, if something happens to me and I'm in the hospital and I can't make decisions for myself, you can do it because you have power of attorney. It was a whole thing. And nowadays, the fact that you can just walk on down to the courthouse and get a, a, a license to be married to someone, regardless of who that is, whether you're a straight couple or a gay couple. People don't get they don't get how that. big that is and how it happened in a relatively short time. It was from yeah. the AIDS crisis to same-sex marriage was approximately a, blink, a decade. It was a blink, and, blink of an eye. Do you guys get involved at all in the sports issue now that you've got boys saying that they're girls and pushing biological girls out of their sporting events. Especially in schools, this is, this is a real issue. The, I forget the, the, the name of the swimmer who got- Riley Gaines. Riley Gaines, uh, I think he was ranked number 348th of male swimmers, but when he said he was a woman, he became a champion. Well, Riley Gaines was forced to swim across, uh, swim and compete against one of these individuals. And so, yes, we do, in the, we had a member recently go to the Jefferson County School Board because I don't know if you heard about the situation where there was a trans identifying child who was a biological male was forced to sleep, was forced to share a bed with a biological girl. Because they're both girls. They're, exactly. They're According to girls. Jefferson they were, they, County they, they, School they were, District, they are. They're both girls. No. So there's nothing wrong. And then the parents find out afterwards that my little biological girl was sleeping with someone who had a penis in the same bed, and she's a little girl, and we didn't even know about it until afterwards. Well, the girl called, called her parents, yeah. and she was terrified. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine being 11 years old and saying, and being told, like, you have to share this bed on an overnight school trip, I believe it was athletics, and what do you say? And again, what did the school say to the girl? Your rights don't matter. Don't tell your His parents. Rights. Did they really? Yeah, so here's, again, this kind of behavior is happening. And so we, we had members show up and speak at the Jefferson County School Board about this. Having more people like you step up is going to change this issue. As a straight man, I can say whatever I want to say, but I'm just another homophobe. I'm just another racist. Well, come I'm be a homophobe a... with me. I've been accused of the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, but the amount of gay homophobes that are growing now is really amazing. So has this been tough on you? I mean, not just coming out gay, obviously it was tough on you, but coming out as someone who is a gay against groomers, has that been difficult professionally? Oh, you know, I'll tell you two stories that have happened to me recently. So about a week ago, I got doxxed by um, a journalist with the Outfront magazine. Did a whole um, thing about me. When you say got docs, what, what did that person publish? Oh, they published where I work. Um, I am sponsoring a ballot initiative right now um, to protect girls' sports. So my, mm. my information is out there on the Secretary of State's website. Phone number, address, right. Right. where I work, um, being a public employee. I <laughs> am privy to certain emails, and I saw the email come through, and there was this whole email campaign as a result of that to try to get me fired from my job you. with the state. Wow. Which is ironic because the lesbian and gay movement for the longest time, even after same-sex marriage was legalized, was to fight for protections in housing and, and employment. And here the gay and lesbian community is now trying to fire and cancel 
people within the LGBTQ community who will not go along with the narrative. This is how vicious cancel culture it is. is. And I've been, I've been so you've denied. Been, you've been doxxed and people are trying to cancel you, yep. get rid of your employment because of your political viewpoints and the charitable work you do here. And I wouldn't even say that this is political. It's, it's interesting to me that this is seen, I, I apparently am a danger and a threat to the community. So there are gay bars here in Denver that will not allow me to enter into their establishment, which is ironic really? because they say, oh, we are all about inclusion and tolerance and acceptance. Bake us a cake, but don't come into our bar. Yo, you ought to live in Boulder as a, as a libertarian conservative like me. Yeah, it's, there's no tolerance. There is no acceptance. Yeah, it is a hateful, hateful place. So what gay club won't let you in? I don't know if I should say anything. Why pending. not? Uh, there's an ongoing investigation. Really? Okay. Yeah, so, but we ought to let them know. And it's a, it's a, it's over there in the Santa Fe Arts District, though. Santa Fe Arts District. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Well, if I knew more about gay clubs, I would be able to tell which one that was. But the idea that you can't, you can't do your work, and it's fear driven. It's fear driven. Well, you are in a danger, and so we want to it. shut you up. Does it have an impact? And, and what I guess what I'm trying to do is get more people like you, more gay and lesbians to say, this is wrong for children. Absolutely. This is dangerous to children. Uh, they need to wait till they're an adult before they mutilate their bodies. But if, if somebody's watching this and go, I, I, I agree with Rich, but I don't want to lose my job over it. Here's the thing. Think about it, think about it. There was a time I... gay men couldn't come out because they could lose their job. Now a gay man coming out and saying, you know, young people shouldn't mutilate themselves. Uh, now the gay men are gonna lose their jobs. Yeah. That's incredible. The thing is, I am not afraid of organizations that are targeting me. You know, there are a bunch of cyber bullies. They're keyboard warriors. By the they... way, there's only one of them. The same guy is hired to do it over and over and over. And so. <laughs> Um, I just, I want to know where they get those giant rainbow umbrellas from, though. <laughs> and maybe I could put a gag logo on it. <laughs> there are more and more gay men, maybe gay women as well, I haven't talked to as many, who are just tired of the whole, they feel the rainbow, has, they've got rainbow fatigue, was the term I heard. It, oh, I, I agree, yes. We, we joke about it with gays against groomers that it's pride year again. <laughs> <laughs> it's pride year. Yeah. All right, let's, let me wrap this up. I, I think what you're doing is just remarkably brave work. People want to get involved, whether straight, gay, whatever. Where do they go? What do they do? Well, we are an organization that is only lesbian, gays, and bi bisexuals and transgenders. You are so intolerant. Us, I know. We, we love you straight people, especially your money. <laughs> so if you want to donate, you can go online, gaysagainstgroomers.com. And we do actually have an ally channel here in Colorado. It's pretty new. So people who are allies and are fighting for it, like Aaron, Aaron Lee is part of it. Um, you know, we coordinate things. And if you are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender, and you want to be a part of this group, you can go and you can click join. And the thing is, I may be a chapter leader, so I'm kind of the front facing person that goes through all of this. So hey, you know what, if you wanna, if you wanna threaten me and send death threats to me, that's, knock yourself out, yeah, right? Go like, for it, what else is new? Yeah, but I understand where people can be intimidated by that and they don't wanna speak out about it. But if, you, if you're comfortable, we have a whole army of people here. We have people who are content creators. We have people who do video editing. We have people who do the research for legislation. We have legislative writers. We have blog and news article writers. There's a whole army of us. And you need more soldiers. More soldiers. And I will tell you that for every one person you see in front of a camera or in front of a microphone, yeah. there are a hundred of us behind the scenes that make that happen. Yeah, uh, just a personal experience on this. You were mentioning the, uh, the haters on, on social media that come after you and uh, write the letters and, and put in the comments. Uh, when I was a columnist for the Denver Post, I got the most delicious hate all the time. It was just, you know, and it was all the same theme, which was, I can't believe the Post gives you the real estate. What an embarrassment for the Post. And it was, it was to get me canceled, which eventually they did. And it was, it was to pressure the, the Post to do it. And I would always get all, all the stuff, you know, in the comment section and all, it was just wonderful. I loved it. And um, there were like, 
eight guys, eight people who were like constantly at it. Just yeah. they, they were just chronic. And it was like, and they really just vicious, vicious. And then one week I wrote a column and not one of them commented on it. Not one of them. And it made me realize, well, either what I wrote was so incredibly persuasive, they, um, uh, they, they agreed with it, therefore they didn't lash their hate on, or they were all out of town on a vacation someplace, uh, and therefore they didn't read it, or it was one guy. And the left, and the, the people who push this stuff, hire people to be multiple personas to help employers feel like there's this army of, of customers, army of constituents who are angry. No, it's just one, one guy whose job it is, and he gets paid to write the hate. And so for people who are looking at doing what you're doing, the hate you see is pre-planned. It is not genuine. It's fake. Well, and they just, what do they do? They spread lies. And when they come after you, they don't have any fact. And so the way you combat that is by telling the truth and sharing the truth. The, the amount of personal vitriol is what, what's amazing. It's not you are wrong. It is you're an asshole. You're a scum. You're this. I can't believe they pay you. But it's not, they never take you on on the substance. It, exactly. it is it's pure intimidation. Because they have no facts to back up what they're saying. Yeah. And so it's bullying. So now they're bullying gays. I'm, it's all come full circle. Rich, thank you so much. This has been really fascinating for me. Appreciate your time. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button too. You don't want to miss a single show.